So we're very fortunate to have as our speaker um, here today Dr. Charles Powell, who is the director of the Royal Elcano Institute um, in Madrid, the premier um, institute think tank on foreign relations um, in Spain. He's been with Elcano for, I think, 17 years, and he's been its director since 2012. Uh, Dr. Powell was educated uh, in Oxford, at uh, St. Anthony's, from which he has a DPhil. He's currently Professor of Contemporary Spanish History at the CEU, San Pablo University in Madrid, and has researched extensively on Spain's transition to democracy, on Spain in the European Union, and I think also on Spanish relations with the United States. So without further ado, I'd like to um, give the floor to Dr. Powell to address us on global Europe, challenges and opportunities, um, the view from Madrid. I should say that his address is on the record, and I understand that the Q&A afterwards uh, will also be on the record. Please turn your mobile phones either off or onto silent, and um, I forget what the uh, instruction on the tweeting is, but you're welcome to tweet uh, <laughs> using what? At I I e a, hashtag I I e a. Dr. Powell. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your invitation, and it's wonderful to be back here. I think this is my third visit to the Institute, um, and I'm really very, very pleased to be here to talk about Europe from a Spanish perspective. Um, in spite of my name, I am Spanish. I'm the son of an English father and a Spanish mother and I'm one of the few people I know who gave up his British passport in order to become Spanish um, about 20 years ago. Uh, and I have no regrets whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't predict Brexit, but I have no <laughs> Let me just say something about our institute. Uh, since I'm going to be talking about global affairs, um, it's actually quite appropriate that I'm here in 2019 because we are celebrating the 500th anniversary of an event uh, in which the person who gives his name to our institute uh, took part. Um, Elcano was, of course, Juan Sebastián Elcano, a Basque and Spanish um, explorer who was part of the famous Magellan uh, expedition. Mm -hmm. And uh, Magellan was murdered by the natives in the Philippines, and the expedition limped back to the Iberian Peninsula under the leadership of Juan Sebastián Elcano in 1522, having completed the first circumnavigation of the world. So we named our institute after him because we regard him as a precursor of globalization. That's a, I know you've all heard about Magellan, but now I want you to remember from now on that Juan Sebastián Elcano, uh, that great man, um, <laughs> played a very important role. We've talked a lot this over lunch about the Spanish election, and I'm happy to answer your questions about um, where Spain is going in the Q&A session. Um, admittedly, the outcome of the talks, um, which the Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez is currently conducting, um, and whether he is successful or not in forming a government, will um, determine whether some of the things that I'm going to say are realistic or not. Um, but we can come back to that later. Um, Spain, as you probably all know, is very strongly in favor of the European project. Um, with the exception of Vox, this new far-right party which obtained 15% of the vote, which is slightly Eurosceptic, um, the whole of the Spanish political spectrum is enthusiastically pro-European integration. And there are probably these four reasons why this is the case. First of all, because historically Europe was seen as an answer to many of Spain's long-standing problems, its socio-economic backwardness, the territorial issue, the fragility of its liberal democratic institutions and traditions, and so on. One of our great Philosophers, Ortega y Gasset, famously said in the 1910s that Spain was the problem and Europe was the solution. And to some extent, this um, notion lingers on. Secondly, of course, the tangible benefits of EU membership have been phenomenal, as is the case with Ireland. Spain today is the 13th largest economy in the world, the fourth largest Eurozone economy, with a per capita GDP of almost $40,000. Thirdly, and this is more controversial, um, European integration is perhaps the on Spain's only widely shared national project. It is probably the only ideal, the only goal, that uh, the only long-term goal that a majority of Spaniards actually ag agree on. 
And the fourth point I want to make is that although Spain went through a brutal uh, six-year-long double-dip recession starting in 2009, which wiped out 10% of GDP of its national wealth and led to unprecedentedly high levels of unemployment, 26% at the worst point in the crisis, in spite of that, this did not significantly undermine support and confidence in the uh, European project. Interestingly, Spanish public opinion did not turn against EU, the EU um, as a result of the implementation of austerity measures by a succession of governments. Um, there was no significant increase, for example, in anti-German feeling, unlike what we saw in Italy or Greece. Angela Merkel has re consi consistently remained and remains today the most popular European leader in Spain. So I'd like to think that this is evidence of um, Spanish, uh, the Spanish public's maturity, which I think is quite refreshing given our tendency to Europeanize failure and nationalize success. Um, perhaps Spaniards have even gone too far in this direction. According to recent polls, Spaniards have more faith in the European Parliament than in the Spanish Parliament. They have more faith in the European Commission than in the Spanish government. And that perhaps is not an ideal situation either. Let me quickly make four additional introductory remarks. First of all, Spain remains as committed as ever to ever closer union. Um, Spain is strongly in favor of pooling and sharing national sovereignty with other member states. I think, as a historian, I like to believe that history matters, and I think this is very much a legacy of the Franco period, a legacy of isolation and relative insignificance. Secondly, Spain is staunchly multilateralist. Again, I think this is a, a reaction to, to that recent authoritarian <coughs> past, and therefore strongly in favor of a rules-based international order. There is widespread political and social support for the notion of creating a strong multilateral order capable of dealing with um, this new multipolar world that we're living in. And of course, Spain has therefore traditionally been in favor of the EU being able to play a prominent role as a global actor. <coughs> the specific reasons for this are manifold. Firstly, I think the realization that challenges posed by globalization require worldwide collaboration and that this is best achieved via multilateral frameworks. Secondly, the belief that member states, even relatively large ones such as Spain, Spain has a population of 47 million, are increasingly insignificant uh, in an era of growing um, great power competition. I think most Spaniards would sub subscribe to Paul Henri Spack's famous observation that Europe can, there are two kinds of states in Europe, small states and small states that don't know that they're small. <laughs> um, and finally, both Spanish elites and those sectors of the population that think about these things strongly believe that the EU should be and is a normative power, uh, to use Ian Manners' um, expression. Again, I think this has a lot to do with Spain's recent historical experience. So what does, Spain, what does Spain expect today from the EU as a global actor? First of all, it expects the EU to uphold this rules-based international order. And let me stress here that Spain was not a founding member of that rules-based international order because of the Franco regime. It didn't join the United Nations until 1953, sorry, 1955. And to some extent, you could argue that Spain only joined that order through the back door, thanks to its bilateral um, military agreement with the US signed in 1953. And the more I think about it, the more convinced I am that in a sense, in a very real sense, Spain only entered the, or became a part of this rules-based international order when it became a member of the EU, the EC, in 1986. And therefore, the idea that this liberal international order should not be taken for granted um, is quite, um, is, is strongly present. And therefore, also, any weakening of the liberal international order is also seen as a threat to European integration. Secondly, currently, Spain sees the EU, um, the EU's global um, ambitions as basically an attempt to, uh, or as a result of the need to live up to the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, and more specifically, um, an attempt to Europeanize these goals wherever possible. Thirdly, the EU is seen as the only actor that can really contribute to the fight against climate change. It's very striking that um, climate change figures so prominently in the Spanish political discourse. We conducted a poll recently in our institute, and we, when we asked Spaniards what should the goal, the main goal of Spanish foreign policy be, 
the, the most uh, popular answer was to fight against climate change, which is, I, when I told the Israeli ambassador this, she almost had a heart attack. She obviously thought it was very postmodern and wimpish. Um, but this is, I think, you know, this kind of approach is very, is very common now, certainly among the political elite, but also large sectors of the population. Why is this the case? Possibly because Spanish coastal areas are very vulnerable to future increases in sea level. Possibly also because Spain is often, um, has often experienced um, flash floods and wildfires, and the population is, is aware of this. So there is very strong support for the 2016 uh, Paris Climate Accord, hence the Spanish government's immediate decision to host the COP25 next month in Madrid when it had to be cancelled in Chile for political reasons. In other words, Spain very much wants the EU to remain true to its goal of achieving carbon neutrality by 2030, and Madrid governments are very active supporters of the EU's um, Green New Deal. This, of course, has an internal domestic aspect to it. Um, all of our economies are beginning to slow down in, in the EU. Spain is still growing quite strongly at about 1.9% GDP this year. But given that uh, monetary, monetary policy seems to have run its course, the only option will be fiscal policy, if, if and when the next crisis hits. And this fiscal policy will probably have to be centered on the new infrastructure and the new technology that the Green New Deal would require. So this is another way in which the domestic, um, domestic social and political perceptions feed into perceptions of the EU as a global actor. Fourthly, Spaniards obviously would like the EU to help them deal with the migration question. The point I want to stress here is that until the 60s and the 70s, Spain was a nation of emigrants. Um, in the 19th century, Spaniards had migrated to Latin America mainly. In the mid-20th century, they began to migrate to uh, European countries. But since the 1990s, like Ireland, Spain has become a nation of immigrants. And during the period 20, the, the, the decade 2000 to 2010, Spain took in more immigrants per capita than any country in the world except the United States. And as a result of that, one in 10 residents of Spain today was born outside Spain. Now, um, you're probably thinking, what are the political consequences of that? And sadly, some people are arguing that this explains the rise of Vox, this far-right party, which garnered 15% of the vote. I actually think that most of um, most Vox support is a result of the Catalan crisis, um, but definitely, it is definitely an anti-immigration party. So the goal of uh, mainstream parties is to fight irregular migration more effectively, but also, and this is very important, to facilitate regular and orderly migration. Um, as someone recently put it, it's not enough to build walls, you also have to build doors and windows. Um, how do we do this? Well, there's an external dimension, basically through more uh, effective cooperation with countries of origin and transit, and in the Spanish case, this mainly means sub-Saharan Africa, or origin, Morocco, transit. And secondly, we need to tackle the root causes of migration, for example, via the EU's external investment plan for Africa. Let's not forget that the EU is already the world's largest um, aid donor. Um, no one is seriously thinking of a Marshall Plan for Africa. I wish politicians would stop using that expression because it's very misleading. Um, but I think the next commission is very much aware of the importance of this. Additionally, there's an internal dimension, and Spain would like to see um, more support for frontier states like Spain itself in times of crisis from EU institutions such as the European Border and Coast Guard Agency. And finally, Spain is strongly in favor of completing the European common asylum system, which, let's be frank, is broken at the moment. The fifth region, uh, reason why Spain would like to see an active EU is for, for, because of the need to cope with the most worrying geopolitical challenge of the 21st century, namely the growing uh, US-China rivalry <coughs> in the areas of trade, technology, and currency. The big question mark here, to quote uh, Durao Barroso, and we were talking about high-level uh, Portuguese um, civil servants a minute ago. The question is how to prevent a great fracture from emerging in the world between a US-dominated US sphere of influence and a China-dominated um, sphere of influence. We already know that this conflict is, first of all, undermining the rules-based international order and at the same time having a negative impact on our European economies. 
I think it's true to say that in Spain there's very little appetite for a G2 world, but it's also probably true to say there isn't much appetite for a G3 world. In other words, the idea that Europe should try to compete with the US and China and buy into their narrative um, is not probably very popular. The goal, therefore, it's not really a question of siding with the US and turning our backs on China. Rather, it's a question of how do we maintain a system in which all sides play by the rules. Um, and therefore, it's also about avoiding being squeezed or boxed in by the two rival superpowers. What's clear is that we can't afford to remain on the sidelines. How do we do this? This is easily said, easier said than done. Um, fu the, the future HRVP, Josep Borrell, in his hearings in the European Parliament, said that the EU has to learn to use the language of power and to play power politics. I'm not sure this is entirely compatible with our self-perception as a normative power, um, and I'm not sure that um, this is exactly where the Spanish mainstream would like to go. I think there is much more agreement on the need for the EU to use its trade policy much more effectively and strategically. Also, the need to reinforce the, Euros, the euro as a currency, uh, the euro's international role in this growing era of uh, currency rivalry, and we have an expert in the Institute who's working on this in particular. And we also, I think, need to work much more closely with other like-minded democracies. We tend to be rather Eurocentric about this. We tend to forget, for example, that there are many um, democratic countries now in Africa, in East Asia, and of course in Latin America. And let me say something very briefly about Latin America in this context, which won't surprise you. Um, Latin America has become a sort of geopolitical black hole. Nobody really looks to Latin America when we try to answer, when we face the big, the big challenges of the 21st century. And Spain, Spain is, is continuing to argue that, we, that the EU needs to take Latin America much more seriously. It's true that it's difficult, given the current political climate in countries like Mexico, uh, Brazil, of course. Um, Argentina is raising a bit of uncertainty about this. But um, again, the EU's answer has to be what it's always done best. In other words, ratify the EU-Mercosur. Uh, agreement, which, let me remind you, we have been negotiating for 20 years, um, and of course ratify the free trade agreement with Mexico as soon as possible as well. What about the Spanish perceptions of China, um, or EU perceptions of China and Spain in that context? One of the difficulties we all face, of course, in the EU is that China is perceived very differently across the Union. Um, according to a recent poll by the Pew Research Center, for example, um, in Sweden, 70% of the population view China unfavorably, and only 25% view it favorably. In Greece, on the other hand, only 32% view it uh, unfavorably, and 51% view it favorably. Spain is somewhere in between. According to this poll, 53% of Spaniards regard China unfavorably, while 39% regard it favorably. Now, the one interesting thing about Spain is that it is not particularly exposed to Chinese influence. It is not really a part of the Belt and Road scheme. It is not one of the 17 EU member states that has signed a memorandum of understanding with China. China only holds about 5% of Spanish public debt. And Spanish uh, presence in China is very limited, partly because the experience of its renewable energy companies was very negative, um, to be totally frank. They, they, their technology was basically stolen. Um, and finally, there is quite a lot of competition between Chinese and Spanish infrastructure companies in Latin America. However, I would say that what characterizes Spain's position in this debate is its pragmatism. Spain does not demonize member states who are closer to China, particularly uh, countries like um, Greece and perhaps Italy and some Central and Eastern European countries. The argument is st instead is that the EU, EU should, first of all, do much more to enhance Asian-European connectivity. And you've probably all heard about the strategy to connect Europe and Asia, which has relatively recently been launched by the EU. We need to do much more to protect EU firms from Chinese encroachment. And Spain supports the new investment screening regulation. Um, it's interesting that many ne member states don't actually have a process whereby they can analyze the nature of Chinese purchases um, there, there are no national institutions or, or national procedures to do this. 
and this investment screening regulation will enable the EU to supervise the purchase, the possible purchase of strategic companies. Spain also believes in the need to encourage national and European champions, for example, via the 100 billion euro European Future Fund, which has just been created to finance the IT sector. In other words, the answer is um, to stop regarding ourselves as inevitably passive bystanders in, in this um, growing conflict and to develop new policies to tackle it. As far as the United States is concerned, I think it's true to say that Spain has always defended a strong EU-US relationship. You may recall the new transatlantic agenda that was signed in 1995 uh, in Madrid. Um, however, to be honest, uh, there are serious doubts, and I think Madrid is not unique in this regard, as to the extent to which we can have a constructive transatlantic relationship under President Trump. Um, again, according to the Pew Research Center, only 7% of Spaniards trust Trump to do the right thing in world affairs. That's the expression they use. Only 10% think that the U.S. takes um, into account the interests of countries such as ours. And according to our own polls, President Trump is consistently the, un the most unpopular world leader, um, together with Putin. Uh, the reasons for sp this uh, some of them are general, because of Trump's hostility to multilateral institutions and agreements, such as the Iran nuclear deal, which Spain strongly supports, and also perhaps more specifically hostility to European integration, for example, in Trump's support for Brexit. There are some reasons that are specific to Spain, however, for example, Trump's hostility towards the Latino population in the United States and his policy on irregular migrants. And when Spaniards are asked which state they prefer as a world leader, 63% still say the US, but 26% say China, which is quite interesting. And in recent months, Spain, of course, has been a victim of the deteriorating EU-US uh, trade relationship following the w WTO's decision to authorize uh, trade countermeasures against the EU in response to decades of subsidies to the uh, aircraft manufacturer Airbus. Spanish agricultural exports worth about 800 million will face U.S. tariffs. We're mainly talking about tariffs on olives, olive oil, and wine. Mm. A note about Russia. Uh, for, for historical reasons, Spaniards have never really perceived Russia as a threat, and this was even true under the Cold War. Uh, today, Russia is not a significant economic player in Spain. Spain does not depend on Russia for its energy. Most of Spain's oil comes from Nigeria, Mexico, and Saudi and most of its gas comes from Algeria, Nigeria, Trinidad and Tobago, and Norway. The interesting recent development is that Russian meddling in the Catalan crisis, and in particular Russian meddling uh, before and during and after the illegal referendum on the 1st of October 2017, has raised an awareness of Russia as a hostile actor which did not exist before. So the healthy conclusion, I suppose, is that you may not be interested in Russia, but Russia is always interested in you. Um, and this is a significant change. It has also led to renewed interest in the EU's efforts to uh, counter a hybrid war, disinformation, um, cyber activities, and so on. In recent years, Spain has sometimes been accused of being soft on Russia. Um, I would argue that it's actually more accurate to say that Spain sees itself as a bridging actor um, between uh, trying to bring together those who are more tough and hardline against Russia and those who seem to be more accommodating. And again, as I was saying, Spain can perhaps afford to perform this bridging role. Of course, given its geopolitical circumstances, Spain has always been much more worried about the southern neighborhood. Uh, you all remember the Barcelona process, which I still regard as the most successful attempt to Europeanize a national priority. However, the um, successor to the Barcelona process namely the Union for the Mediterranean, which was set up in 2008, has, uh, if you like, enjoyed far less Spanish ownership. In other words, um, I think Spanish political elites and the think tank community and so on regard um, the Union for the Mediterranean as something of a failure and perhaps a not very effective um, neighborhood policy. Spain's priorities are in the Maghreb, for obvious reasons, above all Morocco and Algeria, uh, for two reasons, immigration, and Morocco here is seen as a key uh, gatekeeper, a key transit country. Moroccans, by the way, often insist that they are essentially a, tra a transit country more than a country of origin. 
and also for the, uh, for because of where Spanish energy comes from. 40% of Spain's gas comes from Algeria. It's deeply sad, I think, that the border between Morocco and Algeria is still closed. Opening this border was one of the aspirations of the Barcelona process, if you remember, and this has not yet happened. The other source of potential source of uh, threat or conflict is the Sahel, our neighbors' neighbors. Um, Sahel in Arabic means border or coast, and traditionally the Sahel um, was indeed the border that separated the Maghreb from sub-Saharan Africa. But as um, a visitor to our institute recently pointed out, there have been three technological, very simple technological innovations which have completely transformed the, Sah the Sahel. And these innovations are the Toyota Land Cruiser, um, satellite, telephones, and GPS. And as a result of that, the Sahel has become a six-lane motorway, ideal for every form of illegal trafficking. So this is very much uh, Spain's major security concern at the moment, which explains the presence of Spanish troops in support of France, for example, in Mali. So how do we respond to these challenges? One of the answers, of course, has to be a much more robust and credible common foreign and security policy, which Spain has always advocated ever since uh, CFSP emerged. And I think I can provide you with convincing evidence of this. First of all, um, Spanish governments would like to limit decisions that are taken by unanimity to the most pressing matters of national interest and would therefore like to see an expansion of qualified majority voting in this area. Spain currently takes part in every single EU civilian and military mission. I think it's the only country in the EU that is in that position. And Spain also takes part in 24 of the 47 PESCO, Permanent Structured Cooperation Projects. As you know, these 47 projects vary enormously in, in terms of their ambition and so on. Um, I think the most important one from Spain's point of view is, a, is the fact that it's leading a command and control uh, project. Spain is also enthusiastic in its support for the European Defence Fund and the European Defence Agency. Partly, this reflects concerns about the future of the defense industry. Spain is, uh, has a strong, relatively strong domestic um, defense industry and is therefore keen to use EU funds and instruments to continue to modernize it and ensure its viability. There is an incipient debate in Spain as well about the concept of strategic autonomy, which, as you all know, features in um, my good friend Natalie Tocci's European Global Strategy. Um, I prefer a different term. I would actually use the term strategic co-responsibility because I think the notion of strategic autonomy stresses uh, a sort of willingness to stand up against the United States and not just a willingness to do things without the United States' blessing. Um, but this is a very popular notion in, in Spanish, uh, among Spanish elites, the idea that the EU should have the capabilities and the wherewithal to conduct um, certain operations without U.S. involvement is very, very popular. Um, and the interesting thing, I think, from our point of view is that Spain has a problem in terms of its military spending. It only spends 0.9% of GDP on defense, much to Donald Trump's outrage. And it's politically impossible to increase this military contribution if it's presented as a NATO demand or, an, or, or let alone a U.S. demand. In other words, the only politically viable way of increasing Spanish military defense spending is to Europeanize it. Mm -hmm. If um, Spaniards understand that this is part of an effort to create a more robust um, EU military um, system, then that will enjoy greater legitimacy. And let me conclude very quickly uh, with a few general remarks um, about leaderships and partnerships. Who does Spain want to do all of this with? Obviously, France is the most important uh, ally and like-minded EU partner, I think, on many of these issues. But Germany, of course, has always been very important. Germany is the most popular EU country in Spain, by the way. It always has been, ever since the 1960s, even un under the Franco regime. So the Franco-German tandem is crucial. Brexit is going to be a blow, not just because of the 200,000 Spaniards who live in the UK, the three or 400,000 Brits who live in Spain, but also because there is now very considerable Spanish investment in Britain as well as British investment in Spain. Um, but on the whole, Spanish public opinion and Spanish elites are rather looking forward to Brexit. Um, 
Spaniards want ever closer union, and I think the general perception is that Britain will always be an obstacle to that. Is there a, a possible, a possibly a, a different uh, potential role for Spain in a post-Brexit scenario? Um, well, first of all, as I think I mentioned earlier, there is no appetite in Spain for a multi-speed or variable geometry Europe, essentially because Spain is very communautaire, and it would be unacceptable if this became more, in, if this actually became institutionalized. Um, however, I think um, there is this realization that Spain needs to move out of its traditional comfort zone, its traditional concentration on Western European partners, and needs to be more proactive in Central and Eastern Europe, needs to take Portugal more seriously, as we discussed earlier, and in general needs to be more strategic about its partnership uh, combinations. Um, there is an incipient redefinition of Spain's role in the EU, by the way, and this hasn't affected the current debate about the next European budget, but it may affect Spain's position in the next five to ten years, basically because during that period Spain will probably become a net contributor mm. to, to the EU. Now, psychologically, I think that's a very big change, the switch from being a net recipient to being a net contributor, and it'll be very interesting to see um, how that affects Spain's standing within the EU as a whole. So to, to conclude then, um, Spain very much, I think, wants to, be, uh, to, to uh, contribute to a more muscular uh, and more credible EU role as a global actor, but a great deal of force will depend on the domestic stability necessary in order to achieve that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charles, for that uh, circumnavigation in the, in the manner of El Cano of the globe and all of the issues that it, uh, that it presents currently. So the floor is open for, for questions. As usual, if you would just please um, identify yourself uh, before posing your, your question to Dr. Powell. Jill? Uh, first of all, thank you so much. That's absolutely a brilliant presentation and most uh, interesting. Um, you didn't mention the MFF, and I just wondered if you could give us a, uh, a sense of where Spain is coming from uh, in terms of the MFF, particularly, I think, because Nadia Calvino um, played an important role mm. um, in the commission, and I think she's one of the first people that I've seen Martin Selmayr uh, sort of stand aside and um, reference in such glowing terms. We participated in a, in a web seminar uh, with them, and he was highly complimentary uh, about uh, Nadia Calvino. So I just wondered how that filters into the Spanish views mm -hmm. on the MFF. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, <coughs> In keeping with Spain's support for ever closer union and for an ever more ambitious EU, Spain would like to see a more ambitious budget. Um, and sadly, we all know that that is not going to happen. Um, Spain is also in favor and is beginning to open up to the idea, or has been opening up to the idea, that there needs to be um, a serious rethinking, which is actually ongoing, of course, about the nature of, of the budget. Um, as you all know, part of it, of course, is on the one hand how we actually raise those funds, but more importantly, perhaps how we spend them. Spain is in a slightly tricky position here because it is still the second largest beneficiary of the common agricultural policy. Um, and that, therefore, limits its um, room for manoeuvre when it comes to demanding more resources for um, the Green New Deal and so on, and, and other areas of, that affect technological innovation, digitize, digitalization, and so on. Um, the MFF hasn't figured at all prominently in the Spanish public debate yet, which is interesting. Uh, it certainly didn't figure at all in the election campaign, but then very little, very little of any substance did figure in the election campaign. It was mainly all about um, Catalonia and future alliances. Um, so basically my, my answer would be that Spain would like to see a new kind of uh, budget emerging from this, the current negotiation process. I think um, in private, um, Spanish actors realize that given German opposition uh, to significant increases in spending, the outcome will be less um, satisfactory than they had hoped for. Um, but 
uh, I think most of the government's efforts are going to be um, invested in trying to make the best of the money that's going to be available for the Green New Deal in keeping with the argument that I mentioned about the fiscal policy in the future. And Francis. Yeah, Francis Jacobs, thank you very much for a very, very interesting talk. Um, I'd obviously very much like to hear your, your views on where Spain is going after the election in terms of government formation. But my main question is really on, on Catalonia. Mm -hmm. um, where is, the, how is the Catalan situation going to be resolved? What are the perceptions of Catalonia, not obviously in Castile and in other parts of Spain, where as you said, it gave a huge impetus mm -hmm. to Partido Popular, in particular to Vox, but what about in places like the Basque Country? What is the perception there? And then finally, what about the European dimension of the Catalan uh, question? I mean, other member states have strongly supported Madrid, but of course there's a lot of, uh, of criticism as well. And mm -hmm. I used to work in the European Parliament. And I, I think I'm right in saying that there are still three elected MEPs who, are, who haven't been able to take up their seats yet. Mm -hmm. And so, within though the group, the affected groups, there's clearly a lot of criticism of, of Spain and Catalonia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, as far as the Spanish government, the future of the Spanish government is concerned, as you know, um, what has happened so far is that in the wake of Sunday's election, um, a pre-agreement has been signed between the Socialist Party and Podemos, the goal of which is to form a left-wing coalition government. So this will actually be the first coalition government in Spanish history since democracy was restored in 1978. Um, whether or not this government actually is actually formed will essentially depend on the Prime Minister's ability to bring on board four or five small regional parties, and in particular to convince Esquerra Republicana de Catalunya, the largest Catalan nationalist party, to abstain. So as long as they abstain, and as long as the government has the support of these small parties, um, the opposition of the right-wing parties, the popular party, Ciudadanos and Vox, um, would not be uh, enough to block the, cre the investiture of uh, Prime Minister Sanchez in, before Christmas is, is the current plan. Um, I would say there's an 80% chance of this succeeding at the moment. And basically, the reason why I say this is because, first of all, for Catalan nationalists of whatever hue, it is, um, from their point of view, it is better to have a socialist Podemos government in Madrid than the alternatives, which would be either an exclusively centre-right government or even perhaps a sort of German-style grand coalition, which in any case seems highly unlikely. So the Catalan nationalist parties have an incentive to abstain, or at least... Esquerra Republicana has an, absent, an, an incentive. The other two separate the Catalan parties which are supporting independence will vote against Sanchez. Uh, Junts per Catalunya and the CUP, which is this very radical sort of semi-anarchist anti-system party. So um, one question, of course, that arises is what does the Prime Minister have to promise um, in order to receive that support or the abstention? of um, ERC, and I don't have a clear answer to that yet. Um, he will probably have to promise some kind of negotiation process or talks about talks, um, although in his pre-agreement with Podemos he has already explicitly stated that this will have to take place within the context of the Spanish Constitution and the Catalan Statute for Autonomy. Um, whether or not that will in the end be enough uh, is debatable, but I think it will be. In other words, um, the, the largest Catalan party is basically trying to position itself as the only Catalan party who can negotiate with Madrid. And this would presumably have some kind of, um, provide some kind of electoral benefit in when the next Catalan elections come around, probably in the month of February or March 2020. Um, it's very interesting to observe what the Basque Nationalist Party has been doing. The Basque Nationalist Party is going to vote in favour of this government. They're not just going to abstain, they're going to vote in favour, although they only have six seats. It's an important contribution. And throughout this, um, the latest phase of the Catalan crisis, they have been a voice of reason and moderation. So their advice to the Catalan nationalists, with whom, of course, they've always enjoyed very close relations, has been... Um, 
a unilateral declaration of independence is absurd, it's not viable, um, it's counterproductive, it's going to divide Catalan society, it's going to turn other, other parts of Spain against you, and it will have no support in Europe. So the PNV, um, which in the past, as you know, also um, seemed to be in favor of some kind of UDI, or at least um, was strongly pro-independence, is currently playing a moderating role. This may also be due to the fact that support for independence in the Basque Country is at an all-time low. It's about 22%, 25%. Um, support for independence in Catalonia also seems to be declining. The Catalan government has a polling, polling organization, and today they published a, a poll according to which um, about 48% of Catalans are against independence and about 42% are in favour. So um, this seems to be simply a reflection of the fact that Catalan society is tired, it is deeply divided, this is becoming a national trauma, a social trauma for a lot of Catalans who otherwise wouldn't be particularly politicised. Um, so I think there is a sort of um, independence fatigue uh, kicking in. Um, as far as the European dimension is concerned, well, you know what the Europe, as you said, um, Tajani, the president of the European Parliament, and Timmermans, the vice president of the Commission, uh, came out very strongly in favour of acknowledging that this is um, a Spanish internal question. Um, I, and I have no reason to think that this will change under the new Commission or indeed under the new Parliament. There are, of course, some MEPs from certain countries where this kind of issue resonates more than in others who will continue to raise um, questions about the Catalan issue. But I think um, I don't see that this is going to be Europeanized in any significant sense. Thank you. There's very little appetite for this, I think, in Europe, at least in national capitals. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Gary Fitzgerald. Um, I'm coming from a military background, so uh, mm -hmm. I'm curious about, um, and I was, a, I was really impressed by the Spanish support for the ESDP that we have there and your support of, of the European uh, voice, if you like, in, in the military field. Um, my question now is more on the Spanish attitude towards Turkey. And with that, if you could include in, in your response, mm -hmm. How, how NATO is um, either weakened or um, will have to change course in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I haven't men mentioned NATO much, um, so let me just add that the idea that we are a community of European democracies applies to both Spanish perceptions of the EU and to Spanish membership of NATO. And, and this explains why, for example, there are Spanish F-18s flying um, over the skies of Lithuania and why there, is, there are Spanish tanks, uh, German-built, Spanish-built leopard tanks in Latvia. Now, this may surprise people, you know, and we spend a certain amount of time trying to explain to Spaniards that there is a justification for this, and I think there are two. One is reciprocity um, and the other is solidarity. And these are fundamental principles. These are EU principles, but I strongly believe that they are also NATO principles. And Spain has also expressed this with, with regard to Turkey. Um, Spain ha deployed a, um, some of its um, uh, Patriot missiles um, on the Turkish border. And in fact, other NATO members have withdrawn them, and the Spanish contingent remains. And that is basically because of this fundamental philosophy. In addition to that, of course, Spain, by the way, has always favoured um, Turkish membership of the EU. Of course, we all know that that isn't happening anytime soon, um, but, but Spain has traditionally been in favour of, of that. I think, on the whole, partly because of what I said about Russia, um, Spain has played a relatively modest role with regard to the debate about um, you know, Turkish acquisition of, of Russian uh, military hardware and so on. Um, but, but I think, yes, Spain is worried about, first of all, the integrity and the internal cohesion of NATO, and perhaps more importantly, um, how we make NATO and EU compatible. Because as the process moves on, 
I think there is growing overlap between NATO and EU. Obviously, um, the territorial defense of our countries will continue to be essentially a NATO issue, but the more active e the EU becomes um, and the greater its ability to project force beyond our borders, I think uh, the, the greater the likelihood that this will make NATO-EU collaboration at the cornerstone, really, of our defense and security policy. Back, uh, please, yes. Uh, of the Institute. Um, you mentioned that Spain is uh, in favor of ever closer union among the, uh, let's say, the European project. What form would that take um, among the 27 or whatever number of member states is going to be there? Given that, um, you know, that would it be one, I'm going to use the model of the United States of Europe, which I believe to be the kind of thing that the Federalists like, being able to project power, military power in particular, which I uh, see as something the French want to do and the British want to do, but um, and tried to do it in Libya and were unsuccessful because they didn't have enough ammunition, mm -hmm. uh, munitions to continue. Or would it be something, I'm going to use the word, uh, a more Swiss model of, let's say, a, you know, deeply divided by languages and culture and history, uh, with a weak center, but very strong um, um, uh, regions. And that even internally in Spain, if I've understood it correctly, um, there's very strong fiscal decentralization for the Basque country uniquely. And, you know, to add a second question, why is that not being applied to the Catalan case at central government level? And Thank you. That, that, that experience of, you know, Spanish central government with the mm. Basque country, is that a model that might be used to inform Spanish thinking on the form of ever closer union? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. That's a very interesting question, and it allows me to link um, both the domestic and the European <coughs> levels. Your question actually raises a very important, a very interesting academic question, which is, does, the, does membership of the European Union promote the federalization of its member states? Or does it promote the centralization of its member states? And I would argue that it does both. Um, on the one hand, European Union membership promotes the federalization of its member states because much of the EU's methodology is federal in, in a very real sense. Um, for example, in the way in which um, projects are designed, but at the same time, EU membership strengthens central governments. I think we could probably agree that Belgium possibly wouldn't exist today if it were not for EU membership. It's so. Exactly. Um, but if you remove the EU component, you know, the limits to that federalization would disappear. I like the idea that, the idea that we are witnessing a transition from nation states to member states. Is Spain a nation state? Well, you know, Spanish politicians um, could spend several days <laughs> trying words. to answer that <laughs> question. <laughs> uh, the Spanish constitution only recognizes the Spanish nation, but it also recognizes what it calls regions and nationalities. So what is a nationality? Um, is it simply an embryonic nation, or is it simply a nation which that, dare, that doesn't dare speak its name. And, and some people talk of Spain as a nation of nations, but of course this is not actually what the Constitution says. The Constitution says there is one nation, one Spanish nation, which acknowledges the right to autonomy of its regions and nationalities. Um, I would argue that in Spain, EU membership has um, encouraged federalization, um, but at the same time, as I was saying, um, it, it's encouraged, it, it's facilitated the survival of, of the central state. In other words, powers, there was a fear in the 1980s, 90s, that central power would be devolved downwards towards the regions and upwards towards Europe, and that there would be an emptying out of the middle, if you like, of the, of the Spanish state. That has happened to some extent in, policy er in some policy areas. But at the same time, since the member state remains the key protagonist, of European Council decisions, uh, 
that means that the central state is still able to supervise the whole process. Um, as far as the fiscal question you mentioned, the Basque country, yes, has a unique position, as does Navarra, another region which is next door. And the reason why this can't be generalized to Catalonia is because the Basque country represents something like 5% of the Spanish economy. Um, the Basque, uh, Catalonia represents 20% of the Spanish economy. So basically, the Spanish system would go bust if the Catalans were given exactly the same fiscal privileges that the Basques enjoy. One of the problems with this, by the way, is that this Basque fiscal privilege is in the Constitution and therefore cannot be changed. Um, but some Catalan politicians and academics have been looking at some kind of version of the Basque model as a way out of the current conundrum. And this is an area, going back to your question, <coughs> which might come up for debate and negotiation as a result of the current talks. Of course, at the same time, um, this would provoke the backlash of uh, you know, uh, Spaniards in far poorer regions of Spain, like Andalusia, the Canary Islands, and so on. As I was mentioning earlier, Catalonia has a higher GDP per capita than every single French region mm -hmm. except Ile de France. That means that it is an extremely wealthy part of Europe. Um, it also raises interesting questions about a future possible independent Catalonia, of course. You know, if, if they aren't willing to sh uh, share solidarity with other parts of Spain, what makes us think that they would share, uh, express solidarity with poorer parts of Europe? That is highly unlikely. Going back to your first, the first part of your question, former Spanish Foreign Minister García Margallo used to talk about the United States of Europe as his goal. So this isn't taboo in any way in Spanish discourse. We are all federasts, as Chris Patton would put it, <laughs> or a lot of us are federasts. Um, obviously, Spanish elites know that there is enormous resistance to the federal ideal in other member states, uh, in France, and of course in the Netherlands, obviously in the UK, but the UK is leaving, uh, we hope. Um, and um, so, it isn't really part of the debate, but and so in other words, there isn't much of a de debate about the finalité of the European project, but I would say that there is pretty widespread support for the idea of the United States of Europe. That, that doesn't uh, shock anyone in Spain. I think there were, were there two questions, Horst. Was there another one? If we could take maybe the last two together, if there was. Connor, and we would leave it at that then. I'm Horst Sitschlag, member of the Institute. My question is about, if you speak about Europe, what is Spanish view on enlargement, in particular to the Balkan states? And in this context, uh, is there a prospect that Spain may lift the veto on accepting Kosovo as a sovereign state? Okay. That's leader enough with my question. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have a second one, if I may say so, there's a much smaller one. Sut and Malia. Yes. I mean, they are still busy being faced with no better than I in Morocco. They, there was a tremendous um, talk about them in the context of immigration. Uh, but I haven't seen anything in the papers, uh, the Irish ones anyway, in recent times. Um, I was not um, I was, um, I was for hearing from you. But I also in Boston, I'm very interested to hear, because there's also a Russian dimension to the, to the Balkans. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both. As far as enlargement is concerned, um, it doesn't, won't surprise you to learn that um, Spain has always been in favour of, of the Balkan enlargement. Um, as a result of Macron's very strong position on enlargement recently, um, some uh, foreign observers understood that Spain was totally 100% uh, behind that position, and that isn't exactly true. Um, I think, you know, philosophically, Spain continues to support enlargement um, for, for all the same reasons that Spain applied for membership in the 1980s. In other words, we want a, a Europe that, that is whole and free. Secondly, geopolitically, as you mentioned, um, if the Balkans are left to their own devices, the danger of them going over to the dark side uh, of the spectrum is quite large. Is quite significant, and therefore 
Uh, we need to make sure that that, that doesn't happen. Um, Spain is in favor of decoupling as far as Albania and um, North Macedonia con is con are concerned. In other words, our perception is that Albania is considerably further behind in terms of the modernization of its institutions, rule of law, etc., while North Macedonia is, is in a better position. Um, so there is strong support for Balkan uh, membership. Kosovo is a special case, and as you probably know, um, future HRVP Morel has promised that Kosovo will be the first place that he visits as HRVP. I think the reason for that is he wants to show people that there isn't a Spanish taboo about Kosovo. There is a matter of principle. It's, it's about international law. Uh, it's not because of Catalonia or earlier about the Basque Country. By the way, when all of this started, there was no Catalan problem because support for secessionism in 2000 was about 15%. Um, so it's about international law. And it goes back to my opening statement about Spain's very strong belief in a rules-based international order, which again is related to the legacy of 40 years of authoritarian Francoist rule. Um, so that Spain would like the international community to take international law seriously. Um, of course, um, if other member states finally agreed to recognize Kosovo, um, Spain would not be uh, an obstacle in, in, in the final stages of that process. Ceuta and Melilla are autonomous communities. They are autonomous cities. They enjoy exactly the same um, privileges and rights as um, the autonomous communities of mainland Spain. And they are totally, uh, they are fully integrated in the Spanish political system. Um, migration is not really such a big issue at the moment. You're quite right. Um, partly because of Morocco's ability to act as a gatekeeper, as I mentioned earlier, hence Spain's uh, obsession with transit countries. Um, it is true that whenever there's, a, uh, a, a, there's political tension with Morocco, the Moroccans have this ability to sort of open, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> look the other way, and, and suddenly we have several thousand uh, young, normally sub-Saharan Africans um, jumping over the fence, and this leads to a lot of well, it, it's very traumatic because they, they hurt themselves when they climb the barbed wire fence. It's, 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 it's not pleasant for them and it's not pleasant for anyone, but um, that is a problem. Um, most of these people are immediately sent to the peninsula. They're immediately sent to Spain because Ceuta Melilla are relatively small territories and otherwise, you know, for humanitarian purposes, that would be intolerable. Um, more importantly, though, is the question of jihadist terrorism a very significant proportion of those arrested and tried in Spain for acts of jihadist terrorism um, are, were people, are young Muslims who were born in Ceuta, more than in Melilla, but mainly in Ceuta. The reason for this is that the surrounding area in Morocco, of Morocco, is also the part of Morocco which sends most foreign fighters to places like Syria. So it seems to be a regional phenomenon in which uh, there's a process of radicalization going on among the youth, both on the Moroccan side and on the Spanish side of the border. So this is um, the, the main security concern that Ceuta and Melilla um, uh, offer. Vox, Vox has won the elections in these places. Um, yes, sorry, Ceuta. Vox has won the, the elections in Ceuta which I think is an expression of the fact that it's, you know, the economy is, is um, these, this is a very poor, a relatively poor city, um, that there isn't much, you know, there's, there's very little industry, manufacturing and so on. Um, so the, the social situation there is difficult and migration therefore, and but also security, um, terrorism, as I've just mentioned, are part of the, of the local debate. So these, these places are under considerable stress, mm -hmm. shall we say. Thank you. Charles, I want to, to thank you very, very much on behalf of everyone here for, that, uh, for giving us uh, a much deeper understanding of, uh, first of all, the very complex internal situation <laughs> in Spain, and you've given it up to date, as, as up to date as it can be. But at the same time, you, you moved seamlessly to the broader challenges at, at global level that, uh, that we face together as members of the Union. And I was happy to hear in the course of your exposition that a, a number of the things you touched on are ones that uh, are very important too in Ireland's um, approach to these issues at EU and global level.
the cap, of course, <laughs> which is always with us. You may, you may cherish it for different reasons, but we won't <laughs> see it uh, as a very important uh, part of the, the budgetary process. And of course, the, the defense and, and uh, support of multilateralism uh, globally is something on which I think uh, we will find a, a great deal in common and much to do together in, in uh, years to come. So I very much hope to see you here again, to see the links between El Cano and uh, the IIEA uh, flourish. In the meantime, I know that Ambassador Castro, is, who is with us here today, will be uh, doing all he can to intensify um, the links between our two countries on the, the EU agenda. But thank you very, very much for your, for your time you. and for pleasure. your words here today. Thank you very much.